Pope Francis has finally returned to using his papal altar in St. Peter's Basilica for possibly the first time since the whole Pac-Man Mama thing went down in October 2019 on the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi. <laughs> it's actually a big deal, and one that hasn't been widely reported on. So let's kind of take a look at the implications of it a little bit, or at least have those in mind as we go over what I'm going to go over today. But my initial thought was that maybe he had finally completed his personal consecration to the Pac-Man Mama, and as a consequence felt okay using the altar again for his public masses. Now I say that in jest, mostly, but his return is an interesting one that is connected to some other things, at least contextually, that have been happening involving Francis this week, so let's go over all of that now. In the past week, Francis again returned to his papal altar for the first time in many, many months. What was the occasion, you might be asking? It was an ordination mass. A picture from that event is on your screen with Francis present with other priests and bishops, and it's quite a sight to behold, and I think it's a good look for him. At the mass, he said some good things about priests needing to be priests, and all the kinds of things that he sometimes says that gets people to lower their guard. For example, this is from the Vatican News Service report on this. Quote, in his homily, Pope Francis urged the nine men to focus their gaze always on Christ as they serve his people. He said their ministry is an expression of Christ's own office of teacher, priest, and shepherd. Priests, said the Pope, are established co-workers of the order of bishops with whom they are joined in the priestly office and with whom they are called to the service of the people of God. He added that their task is to preach the gospel, to shepherd God's people, to celebrate the sacred liturgy, especially the Lord's sacrifice. End quote. If he said the kinds of things he said at that Mass and acted in this way more often, and wasn't involved in odd partnerships with the Leviathan and all the would-be Caesars of the world, then Francis would be just another pontiff, and most of us wouldn't be paying much attention to the things going on in the Church at all. But that's the thing. The papacy has changed dramatically in the last few decades, and at least one writer has said that the papacy has become an impossible job to do. It's an odd characterization for the papacy, by the way, since it's sort of the penultimate priesthood for any human being to attain to, being a Christ's high priest on earth, you know, and as such, the papacy isn't exactly a job, but a vocation. It is a calling. Some are called to the priesthood, some are not, in the same way that some are called to be pope, and some are not, and when someone who isn't called to a post like that finds their way into one, it rarely goes well. A different article came out in the past couple days that touches on this topic. It is from Crux now, and as always, Crux professes to be taking the Catholic pulse. And the article has the following headline. Let's face it, the modern papacy is an impossible gig. The piece is by John Allen Jr. I want to look at this because there is a problem with the thinking that the papacy, and it's inadvertently exemplified in this article, We, in our times we have an odd idea about the papacy. So Mr. Allen begins by outlining all the things the papacy has been involved in, or major stories from around the world in the past few months, some of which I can't go into here, you hear, which is why I'm not reading it verbatim. But you can probably guess what they are, and they themselves aren't all that important anyway. They all touch on Caesar, the secular world, and involve things rarely important overtly to the church. But then Mr. Allen says this, quote, Is there a common denominator? Yes. In today's world, the Pope is expected to have something to say about all of them. We live in a time of instant opinion in which perspective is generally the first thing to be tossed out. Nevertheless, there's a bit of perspective anyone who follows Vatican News in the Catholic scene ought to try to keep in mind. The papacy, as it's come to be understood, is an impossible gig. I'm not talking about the, how the papacy is defined in, say, the Catechism of the Catholic Church or the Code of Canon Law. Those formula are time-honored, immutable, and honestly, elastic enough to accommodate all manner of concrete applications. I'm talking about the expectations in the popular mind, in the street, around the water coolers, on TV and in newspapers, on social media, and so on. End quote. He goes on to say that we expect the Pope to be both a master of diplomacy and engaging in the great sea of secular concerns with the various Caesars of the world and that we expect the Pope to be able to wrangle with the Fortune 500 CEOs, media stars, athletes, you name it. Here's the thing. I don't think most Catholics want that in a Pope. There is a depiction of the Pope in an awful HBO show, The Young Pope, and I say awful because he gets ruined with the usual Sixth and Ninth Commandment stuff that is omnipresent these days, but it's also got other issues too. But I like the depiction of the Pope in that show for one real reason. He rejected all of that and chose for the Pope to remain hidden. 
It was a call back to better times in the church when most Catholics didn't spend much time thinking about the Pope and what he was doing. And no, I'm not endorsing that show at all. I watched it when I, before I knew better. Anyway, in those better times, the lady would pray for the Pope, and if he released a statement to be read at the Mass, they listened. If he said something at an Ubi at Orbi event, they listened. But that was it. So no, I don't really think we want or need a pope to be a figure that wrangles with the forces of the world like this. It isn't necessary for the church, and it isn't necessary for the gospel, because you may have noticed that in the decade after decade of this approach being taken by the various popes of the late 20th century onwards, they haven't spent much time on the gospel in this new approach at all. Francis wasn't the first to be to do the globe-trotting thing, and he won't be the last either. Unless the events of Catholic prophecy come to pass in the near future, then none of this will matter anyway. Instead, here are some words from Francis that he should heed himself. At his ordination mass in this past week, Francis told young priests to focus on the priesthood, to focus on the laity and their needs, and to focus on our Lord. Quote, Pope Francis then warned of the perils of vanity and the pride of money. The devil comes through your pockets, warned the Pope. Be poor, as poor are God's holy, faithful people. Bringing his homily to a close, Pope Francis recalled that these four forms of closeness are the path to being shepherds, because Jesus consoles shepherds, because he is the good shepherd. Seek consolation in Jesus, concluded the Pope, and carry the crosses in your lives. Do not be afraid, he said. Everything will be all right. End quote. He isn't exactly wrong in those words, and I wish he'd heed them himself, because if he did, he wouldn't be having official Vatican meetings with rock musicians on topics that neither he nor the musician had any real business engaging in. He wouldn't be having conferences at the Holy See with famous figures whose work is opposed to the work of the Church. There would be no partnerships with the Leviathan for the good Archbishop to write letter after letter about, and he wouldn't be talking about Catholic prophecy as much as we find ourselves doing. For example, in Quito, Ecuador, Our Lady of Buen Successo de la Piofricación, better known by the mistranslated name of Our Lady of Good Success, and if you've never heard before that the name was mistranslated, I've got videos on that. I'll have one at the recommended at the end. But she told us in the early 17th century that in our times specifically, we would see priests who cared more about money and influence than they did their flocks. She said that specifically. 400 years before it came to pass, and if the papacy is the ultimate priesthood for our blessed Lord on earth, then Francis's words should be directed at the cardinals and bishops in his own employ, and he should heed them himself, because while Francis talks a lot about separating new priests from material concerns that often get a priest into hot water, he himself and his Vatican are the perfect example of what he is trying to keep them from falling into. St. John Vianney is the patron saint of the priesthood, and for good reason. Aside from his personal story and his long journey to ordination, which is a great one itself, if you haven't read a life on, uh, Lives of the Saints on St. John Vianney, really, you should go pick up a book on him. He's great. His priesthood has become legendary for his absolute dedication to the souls under his care. He would spend long hours in the confessional. His dedication quickly earned him a reputation that caused the faithful to travel from far-flung places just so he could hear their confessions and attend their masses. He was not a famous conference speaker or famous for being an exorcist or famous for making cutesy videos on YouTube where he dialogued with people. No, he was famous for saying the mass, giving the homilies hard for our modern ears to take, for spending up to 18 hours a day hearing confessions from people all over France. He has a couple of pertinent things to say on the subject. Quote, Without the priests, the passion of our Lord would be of no avail. It is the priest who continues the work of redemption here on earth. What use would be a house filled with gold were there no one to open its doors? The priest holds the key to the treasures of heaven. It is he who opens the door. He is the steward of the good Lord, the administrator of his goods. Leave a parish for 20 years without a priest, and they will end up by adoring the beasts there. The priest is not a priest for himself. He is a priest for you. End quote. And he is absolutely 100% correct. You only need to look around and see the state of things now to see that he is right. But the second pertinent thing he has to say is the following. Quote. Cannot please both God and the world at the same time. They are utterly opposed to each other in their thoughts, their desires, and their actions. End quote. And that's something every pope should heed, especially the ones from the second half of the 20th century on. For the papacy has found itself embroiled more and more with the world with each passing papacy, to the point where the sight of a pope boarding a plane to meet with dignitaries isn't even unusual anymore. St. John Vianney's words are something for every pontiff to heed. 
It isn't that the papacy has become an impossible job. It's that the church has turned its gaze towards the world, and the papacy has attempted to conform itself to the world and its ideas. And in so doing, it's become an impossible job because, as St. John Vianney said, you cannot please both God and the world. It is when these positions that are vocations and not jobs get filled by people who misunderstand them, or worse, that we find ourselves in this position, where we wonder how the church found itself hosting conferences where rock musician and others who have no business speaking at the Holy See are now key guests for things utterly in opposition to what Christ and his church would be doing. Truly strange days we are in, when St. John Vianney's words are almost a new concept to us. What do you think about this? Is the papacy an impossible job in the world because the Pope needs to be doing these things? Or has it become that way because the church has turned its eyes in the wrong direction? Am I wrong on this? Let me know your th thoughts in the comments, please. And like, subscribe, hit that notifications bell so you don't hit any miss anything. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.